Right on. Oh, okay. Huh? Oh, yeah. They, they got it figured. So a couple things um, coming up is the um, 360 Leadership Day. I know we have, a, we have, I think, 11 people going, which is exciting. So um, that means we'll, we'll try to take advantage. I won't be driving up because we'll go up the night before because both Sherry and I have to present and I have to get there at like um, like before 8 a.m. And you guys saw me on Easter Sunday, so or that that's a hard. <laughs> so, but um, but yeah, we're gonna be up there. So I'm excited for that. I've actually we just had the last planning meeting for that, and I last week actually went up and talked to the guy I'm presenting with, and so it's, I'm I'm pretty pumped about it. It'll be a good a good um, good event this year. A lot of different good things and so um we're excited about it and so um the other thing we have been going through the process for elder selection and we took names and then we we prayed over the names and then we um narrowed it down and came up with lists of people to ask and, and we asked them to pray about it for for some time and so i um we've it's it's taken a little bit it's not taken more than six weeks i don't think but um, we now have our, our two names that we're um, going to ratify for elders. It'll be Brenda, um, Brenda Palmer and then Holly Sipes. So um, that's, that's going to be um, who we put up for ratification. And that meeting will be on the 21st. Okay, so we, we make sure we have enough announcing time according to the bylaws. And so... Sorry, Beth Ann, we, we stole her. I know. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. So, but, but we're, we're excited to be through that. And so um, that, that meeting will come up and we'll have that meeting after church. And essentially we'll just um, do a quorum and then hand out the ratification ballots and go through that. So, um, but the 21st, yes. So it's not this Sunday, but it's the following Sunday. Again, so we make sure that we announce enough and let everyone know and, and go like that. Okay? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. You might get kicked if you do that. So um, before we get started, do we have any prayer requests? Okay, what's Harry Harry Barnett? Okay, be praying for Heron, uh, Karen as well. Yeah, Utoka Jones family. She uh, passed away. Yes. So be prayer for. Okay. Wendy Marshall. Um, remember um, Dakota Dixon. Sorry. Yeah. I, I For the life of me, couldn't. Yep. So we had the, the prayer walk for him was um, Sunday. It was, it was good. There were um, between 40 and 50 people there. So it was a good event. And so I'll be praying for him. Any other prayer requests? Bob Drenning, okay. Okay, Bethavik family and Linda Vall. Okay, give me just a Man, everything's all wonders of technology. Lydia Stauffer. S-T-A-U-F-E-R. O-U. Okay. Okay. Any other prayer requests? Uh, okay. Do you know his name? Okay. Do you know his name? Nope. Okay. So, one of um, Rory's co workers. Uh, dad's in the hospital.
Okay. Tom, or Dylan Baker, yes. Pat Lemon. Okay. Um, I've got a praise. Sherry, um, she actually just, for the last couple of weeks, has been interviewing for a different position at her school. And she got the call yesterday that she got the job. So she is going to be a course instructor for the um, s the HR department. So like the teaching HR and stuff. So she's pretty excited about that. And so I think it'll be good fit. And it keeps it's something that will keep her active and things. But she's she will start the training for that. I think the 29th. Oh yeah, yeah. It's still all from home. It's yeah. So um, and the, there's some irony because she actually had applied for this job before she got her PhD finished, and um, they several people had told her, "Oh yeah, you have it. We'll be HR will contact you." And something happened. They changed the policy, and then she didn't get it. But the person who did get it is one of the people that keeps recommending her for the job anytime it comes up. And so so yeah, it's just kind of a, a fun thing. But yep. She's so she'll start that. So be praying for her too, because that will mean some changes and stuff, and how we go about some things and household things. And so, but um, she's really excited because it'll give her a lot of a lot of one-on-one -on -one with students, and she really likes teaching, and so um, she gets to do more of that. But, yep. Any other prayer requests? Okay. Well, let's, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for today. I pray that you'd be with all of these prayer requests, God. We thank you for the fact that before we even mention them, you know each of these people's situations, and we just pray that you'd be with them. We know that you care about them, and we, we also know as we bring these requests to you, you will answer. God, we just pray for Harry Bardet, and we pray for um, Karen Haney, we ask that you'd be with the Utoka Jones family as they're mourning. Be with Winda, Wendy Marshall um, as she's in, in the hospital. We just pray that you continue to be with Dakota Dixon and his family um, and, and just everyone involved with, with his treatment in Hershey, God. We uh, pray that you'd be with um, Bob Drenning and the Thavik family. Pray that you'd be with Lydia Stouffer and Lynn Duvall. God, we pray that you'd be with this co-worker of Roy's father, who's not doing well. We pray that you'd be um, with Deb as she continues to recover. Uh, we thank you for the good news with the surgery. We pray that you'd be with the, um, Dylan Baker and just um, put your healing hand on him. We pray that you'd be with Pat Lamont, God. And God, tonight as we come together and as we study your word, we, we just pray that you'd be with us tonight as we look at your word, as we study um, and really look at how your entire word is about the goal to exalt you among the nations, as we've been talking about, God, and with you in the, the whole Bible as a story that is meant to point to you and is meant to re let us know about Jesus. And so we pray that you would be with us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So, how is your best friend similar and different from you? Okay. How's that a loaded question? Mm hmm. Yeah, amen to that. We've, we've, we've spent time with you both. Mm hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, no, I mean, if you, yeah, I mean, we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and part of the idea also is what draws you to people? 
What, what makes, you know, they, they say if you want a close friend, you, to have a close friend, you have to spend like, like 80, 80 hours with them. Yeah. So, so one, of my, one of my best friends, other than Sherry, is you guys, I think you guys have all met Dave. He, they, Dave and Steph, they came there from Indiana. They came with their two kids um, not the, last Easter, and so they were here. He's very different than me. He's like, he's like six foot five, you know. Um, he, you know, he works, well, he works in insurance now. He worked at a bank. But what connected us is when um, I came to the church at um, West Anderson Church of God as the pastor. And we connected. And, and part of it is then we had kids the same age. Um, Ruthie, um, Ava is uh, about nine months older than Ruthie. And then Jackson is about nine months older than Heidi. And so we have kids near the same age. And also we, we went through a lot. We lived in the same area, you know. And so because of all those things, we were really bonded. I mean, they're, you know, they, they, they are family. In our minds, you know, we we this last uh, New Year's Eve, as we were on our way back from Missouri, or, no, not on our, we didn't go to Missouri. We just went there for new for New Year's because we didn't go to Missouri. But every New Year's Eve, when we go to Missouri, we stop there on the way back because it's a good halfway point. But also, we get to spend some time with them. You know, we go to on vacation together. Um, but what drew us together had to do with the things in common, but also I think some things that we went together through at the church. And he was actually, he became part of the, um, part, part of the board of the church um, during our time there. And so, um, but yeah, it's always interesting to think about what draws you to someone and how you're connected. Um, and it's never like programmatic, you know. And, and a lot of times we find out that um, we find out we have a lot of similarities with people we didn't know. And that usually draws us a little closer. So um, the pastor I was, I was at with um, up in Butler, Brandon, I remember we were up there for a meeting um, with the, the, the leadership development team because this was before we did our event there last year. And Herb and I, we, were, we went and talked to Brandon. And then in the mid- middle of this, we see I see some books I like to read. And I see some of the books are books I've read and books I'm reading and there are authors I'm interested in. And so we kind of nerded out over that. Well, but th- that showed me, oh, this is, this is someone that has some of the same interests that I do, you know. And because of that, I think we've connected more with that. And so it's always interesting what connects people, but also um, how really in it, it's how we spend time together. Um, but, but I've got friends who are very different from me that we have one thing that's in common, or we've been through something in common. You know, going through something, especially if it's traumatic, that that bonds you. Um, and so I have friends that have very different attitudes of a lot of different things than I do. There's this diversity there. And so, um, and it's, it's a good thing, you know. Um, God has designed us to have, if you think about all your friends, You've probably got some diverse opinions, diverse ideas, um, diverse, you know, way they go about things. And when we look at when we as we start to look at the church, that's what God intends. And so we've talked about that already in one of our previous sessions. But um, but really, all of this comes back to how God's desire is to draw all people from every nation, from every tongue, from every tribe to him, to know him. And be exalted. And so um, we're going to talk about that some more. So um, we're going to watch the, the session. As you guys watch the session, the, the, um, the questions, there are a couple questions to look over for that, for just to think about as you're watching it. Whom has God chosen to exalt his name among all people? And where in the Bible do we find the theme of sharing the good news of God with people of every tribe and tongue? Okay, so we're going to watch the video and then we'll go from there. All right. 
We are halfway through this study, and I fully realize that some of you may be tempted to check out, especially with the last couple of sessions. You're thinking, wait, this study is about missions. This is for missionaries, the people God calls to go to other nations with the gospel. And that's not me. And I get it. I used to think that way too, until I really read the Bible. Or actually, until someone showed me what I had not seen in years of reading the Bible. And that's what I want to show you in this session. I want to show you how God's Word, which is the foundation of our faith, is one overarching story about how God is spreading His love and His glory among all the nations. We so often miss this, at least I have, Reading the Bible here and there, like stories and books and letters in the Bible, are disconnected from each other. And we miss the big picture. And my hope is that as a result of this session, whenever you open the Bible, you will realize one, what the big picture story you're reading is all about. And two, that you will recognize that your life is now caught up in this same incredible story. So go with me back all the way to the beginning of God's people. After sin had entered the world in Genesis 3, and God promised to send a redeemer, a savior who would reconcile sinners to himself, then we come to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, where God first calls Abraham, our forefather in the faith, and the Bible tells us, the Lord said, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Did you see that? God, from the very beginning of his people said, I'm gonna bless you as my people for the spread of my blessing to all peoples, to all the families of the earth. And it's interesting, God speaks the exact same way to Abraham's son Isaac in Genesis 26 and Isaac's son Jacob in Genesis 28 about how God wanted to bless them so that they would be a blessing to all the nations. And then you keep going in the Bible, and you see God bring all of his people out of slavery in Egypt. Why? For the sake of his name among all of the nations. That's Exodus 14, 4, and Psalm 106, verses 7 and 8. Then you start to see that all the stories of the Bible have this same purpose. Think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego delivered from a fiery furnace in Daniel 3, so that a pagan king declares that God is worthy of worship among all of the nations. The same thing happens when Daniel is delivered from a lion's den in Daniel 6. Then you read how the temple in the Old Testament was established as a place where all the nations could come and behold the glory of God in 1 Kings 8. Then you turn to the Psalms, where you see this theme all over the place, summarized in the prayer that we've already seen in Psalm 67, verses one and two. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. You see it? Enjoy God and all of his glory, all of his grace, and exalt God among all the nations. And then you read the prophets in the Bible, where God reminds his people in Isaiah 56 that his temple is a house of prayer for all the nations. Ezekiel 36 talks about how God blesses his people, not ultimately for their sake, but for the sake of his name among all the nations. God specifically calls Jonah the prophet to proclaim his word for the salvation of Nineveh in the heart of a foreign, even an enemy nation. So then it's no surprise in the Bible to turn the pages into the New Testament 
and see Jesus say what we've already looked at in Matthew 28 and Acts chapter 1. Go, make disciples of all the nations. Be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. In the end of the book of Luke, this is an essential part of the gospel itself. Listen to Luke 24, 46 and 47. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And that theme continues all the way to, as we've seen, the end of the Bible, where all of history culminates in all the nations, all the people groups of the world, praising God for his salvation. So here's the deal. I remember where I was when someone first showed me this big picture story in the Bible, how the Bible is one amazing story about the spread of God's glory among all the nations and how my life is a part of this story, how I'm alive for that purpose. And then I heard what we've discussed. I heard about billions of unreached people in the world. And I started thinking, well, if this is the big picture story, of the Bible, and this is the purpose of my life, to enjoy and exalt God and all of his glory among all the nations, and there are nations where the gospel hasn't gone, then I need to become a missionary to another nation. And my wife, Heather, and I started praying through that for our future, and one day, I was scheduled to have breakfast with the president of an international missions organization. His name is Jerry Rankin, and the night before I went to breakfast with him, I talked with Heather and I said, I think I'm going to tell him that we're ready to go to another nation. Is that okay with you? And she said, that's okay with me. So we prayed. The next morning, I went off to breakfast with great anticipation. As soon as we sat down, I started pouring out my heart about how I see this big picture story in God's Word. I know this is the story God has written for my life. I want to live for His glory among the nations. So my wife and I are ready to go. And he looked back at me for about 60 seconds and encouraged me in what I had just said to him. And then for the rest of breakfast, he talked with me about the need for pastors to work in the church where the gospel has gone for the spread of the gospel to nations where it hasn't gone. And I was so confused. I went home that day. Heather was all excited. She asked how things went and I told her, I think I just got talked out of becoming a missionary. And Heather's face dropped. It was like I had disappointed her, like I'd failed the interview and ruined our chances of going as missionaries. But looking back, I am so thankful for that breakfast conversation that day. Because Dr. Rankin put a category in my mind that I don't think was there before. Looking back now, I don't know why it wasn't there, but here was the category. Apparently, there is a type of person who is passionate about seeing God exalted among all the nations, but who doesn't become a missionary. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, of course there's a category like that. Somebody who's passionate about seeing God exalted among all the nations, but doesn't become a missionary? That's called a Christian, right? Like, are missionaries the only people who are passionate about seeing God exalted among all the nations? Where's that in the Bible? From beginning to end, from cover to cover in the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, all of God's people are created to enjoy God and exalt God in all of His glory among all of the nations. This actually is for all of us. We've talked about it. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus Christ living inside of us. So just ask the question, does the spirit of Jesus want the world for Jesus? Well, absolutely he does. So do you have the spirit of Jesus in you? Then you want the world for Jesus. You are passionate about seeing the nations reached for Jesus because Jesus in you is passionate about reaching the nations. This is fundamental to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. God help us. We've taken the ultimate purpose of God, the story of His Word, and we've made it an optional program for a select few Christians in the church. According to the Bible, 
The spread of God's glory among all nations is not an optional program for a few Christians. According to the Bible, the spread of God's glory among all the nations is the purpose for which every Christian has breath. Now, here's the deal. I know some of you may be hearing this, and some of you are walking through all kinds of things in your life right now, hard things in your life, your family, your work. And I would just say, I get it. Trust me, I get it. But I want to encourage you, as we think about billions of people unreached by the gospel, just imagine for a moment going through hard days like you're experiencing without the gospel, without God, without the hope that you are going to make it through. Imagine going through hard, difficult days of suffering, and the reality is when you die, it's only going to get worse, and it's going to last forever and ever and ever. We don't talk about taking the gospel to the nations because everything is easy and going smoothly in our lives. We talk about taking the gospel to the nations, and we live for this because we want people in a world of sin and suffering and hurt and pain and death to know there is a bigger story. There's a story of a king who has come and who's conquered all of it. And he has made it possible for us to have hope and joy and peace and eternal life and a love relationship with God for all of eternity. So here's what I want to encourage you to consider and discuss. One, consider your own life. What would it look like for you to align your entire life with this big picture story? To see all of God's blessing in your life as a part of His desire to spread His blessing to others. How does that change the way you spend your time? How does that change the way you spend your money? How does it change your marriage? or your parenting, or your life as a teenager? How does it change your plans and dreams for the future? And then I want to encourage you to consider and discuss what it would look like if your church was filled with followers of Jesus who were all living with a passion to see God exalted among all the nations of the world. What would it look like to be in a community where everyone was living with zeal to enjoy God in all of His glory and exalt God among all of the nations? And just ask, could it be that foundationally this is what the church is supposed to look like in the world according to God's Word? So, that question, what does it look like? What would it look like if you aligned your life with that, that big picture? God being exalted among the nations. You know, and the nations start in Broadtop, in Robertsdale, in, in the state of Pennsylvania, in the U.S., but the nations are spread out. So, you know, some, some people, when you talk about the nations, they're like, but we need to do stuff here. I'm like, yes, that's part of the point. We're, we're part of that. But the idea of what would it look like for, I'm going to pull that off, um, us as individuals to, to more and more align ourselves in that way. And that when we look at Acts, we see that is the point of the church. That's, that's what they were about. They, they, they had boldness, and they boldly proclaimed Jesus. And it wasn't just, you know, Peter and John and Paul later on that went out and did those things. It was the church. Yeah, you had people who were sent out on mission. You had Peter and John and the apostles. You had, you know, um, Thomas, who we talked about Sunday, went to India. You had, had Philip. You had all these people that they went to these places but you also had others who were supporting them. I think of, of when the church of Antioch 
they fasted and they prayed. And out of that fasting and that prayer, God directed them to send Paul and Barnabas. I really like to eat. So if I am fasting about something and praying about it to that extent, that shows that I'm very passionate about it. That's what we see in the early church. And so that's part of what it means to be be the, the church. Doesn't mean we always are perfect at it. But I think when we look at those things, the little things that, that gets us upset, because let's be honest, we've had little things in all churches that get people upset, right? Honestly, they aren't the important things. And so I think that's part of the kind of the powerfulness of understanding that there is, there is the one thing, and we need to passionately seek after that. Um, I love the, 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 the discussion that he had about the realization of, well, yeah, there is a category of person that is passionate about what God wants to do, but isn't a missionary, that isn't going to the nations, and I'd even say isn't, isn't a pastor, isn't you know, a traveling evangelist, or however the gospel is, is presented to the nations, and that's a Christian. And I think that's sometimes we get this idea that there are these categories of individuals and, and well, missions and evangelism and me being able to tell why I follow Jesus, that is optional for your everyday Christian. There's no such thing as an everyday Christian. You know, um, and we see that in the New Testament. So I, that that was just really stirring for me as I w- was preparing this afternoon for this. So here's a question. What perspective have you had about the nature of mission? Can you relate to the idea that many have had that? Well, it's just for some people or the idea that, well, we are all is that the idea every Christian is supposed to, in some sense, be a missionary. What do you guys think? Okay. Yep. Unless God calls you there. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm, no, yeah. Yeah. We are we are that and that's the idea. Yes, you have those who are sent, but we are all a sent people. So you have those who maybe have a special assignment, like our missionaries, like the, the Noctigals in Italy. You know, they have that assignment and they have they've served in China and they've served in um in Germany, when they were over the, the, over the three worlds, and now they're in Italy. They have that calling. But yeah, we, we can be part of those things. That's one of the things, you know, that is it's helpful to remember. It's bigger than us. That's why, you know, last year I had um, Rise Up Ministries come and, and talk about their trip that they're doing. That's why when, when Wayne and Tracy went on that trip and came back, they... Um, when Wayne's like, well, OK, we could do like a short presentation. I'm like, no, no, this is too important. You guys, you guys are going to take the teaching time because we want people to understand that we're all supposed to be about this. And it, like I said, here, there, wherever, you know, in the in the um, in Matthew, the um, a, a more literal translation um, that isn't as kind on the ears is in your going meaning wherever you go, wherever you're at, as you're going, you know, um, down the street, or if you're going, you know, and if you find yourself where you're called to someplace else, take the gospel there with you as well. So, but yeah. Um, so, uh, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. This is what it says. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. 
and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. I mean, we, we looked at this earlier this spring, a couple of weeks ago. But, but think about that, that God chose a particular family and actually planned to bless all the nations through this one family. Think about that. That the children of Abraham, their, Abraham, their family, that family, was the way that God was choosing to be exalted among the nations so that the nations would come to him. I mean, David talked about the many places in the, the Bible, in the Old Testament, where we see God's idea of, of being exalted among the nations all over the place. You know, in Exodus, that God brought the people of Israel out so that his name would be exalted among the nations. We t- you talked about in Daniel and with the, the three youths, and you talked about Daniel and the lion's den, how those things happened so God could be exalted among the nations. Um, we talked about how the temple was made so that the nations, the Gentiles, would come to the temple and see God exalted and be brought in um, I love um, Jonah. Jonah is the, Jonah wasn't happy with God's plan. You know, he, he didn't want to go to Nineveh, but God's like, no, this is my will. This is what needs to happen, and they need to hear what's coming. And so, like, the whole point of the book of Jonah is about God's not just for the Jewish people, but he's also for the Gentiles as well, and he wants them to come to know him. And um, Jonah was called to that. And because Jonah proclaimed in some way, shape, or form, I really don't think he like yelled it. He, I kind of have this image. He may have muttered it around and someone heard it and, and they spread it out. But because God's message was proclaimed to them, that, that, whole na- that whole city and that nation was saved. And they repented. Um, and then we see in, in Acts... You know, it begins with the Jewish people, but very quickly Antioch becomes where the center of Christianity is, and the Gentiles believer very quickly eclipses the Jewish believers, and the na- they just spreads throughout the nations. God began all of that with one family, the family of Abraham. And according to the New Testament, we are spiritual children of Abraham, so we're part of that family too. So. We have a job as well. What do you think it looks like to bless others by discussing Jesus with them? But what does that look like? That's what it feels like. Okay, but it, but what's it? What is it? What what's it look like? Okay, I mean, but yeah, but that that's how it feels. But how? So, Jamie, how would you bless someone by talking to them about Jesus? That's the question. Okay, okay. Well, how do we do that in everyday life? That's the question. Okay, but what else? I mean, no, uh, yeah. Well, and, and what else? What, anyone else? Our actions, yeah. Guess what? We are supposed to love people. Okay, I, I have to be real honest. The church does not have a really good track record of living that out. We live in a world that they look at the church because of what has been done in the past, and some of it is warranted that they don't see the church as loving. Guess what? We have work to do. Um, and that's... So loving people, how we act, how we treat people, you know. And part of, part of the thing is the history of the church. There is, there's a lot that the church has done that changed the world, and um, we just need to lean into that tradition, you know. I, I talked, to, I, talked to, I think, a couple of weeks ago on Wednesday night about how, you know, it's because of the church that we have hospitals, that we have public schools, that we have orphanages, that we that we no longer, if someone has a disability or birth defect, they aren't just left out to the elements. You know, people who are less fortunate are taken care of. Um, you have have you know people who help the homeless. That that is 
the, the legacy of the early church. They lived those out. They do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and yeah. Well, it, it's not a question of what if we're gonna have problems at times. It's really a question: What do we do when we have failed? What do we do when we inadvertently hurt people? Or what do we do when we have a bad day and we don't inadvertently hurt people, but we have to ask for forgiveness to them? Do we do that? And that those things—that's what love looks like. You know, um, love is. It is Bethan. It's very love is very hard. Yep. But guess what? We don't have to do it on our own. That's part of the thing. We have the Holy Spirit that is supposed to guide us, but we but we have to listen and and we have to train ourselves. That idea, you know, when when I play basketball, right? I remember having to like train myself exactly how to shoot, you know, and exactly, you know, get the whole body ready to do it so I didn't have to think about it anymore. And I could make a, you know, I could shoot a free throw shot without even thinking. Well, that, that's, we have to do that with how we love people. And the, the, the harder it is, the more practice we get sometimes. And so I think sometimes people, or not people, God puts people in our lives that try us to give us better training. You know, that, that's actually God saying, I believe in you and you can do this. Here you go, you know. I'm not saying I'm always happy about it either, Beth Ann. But I, I do think that happens sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay, to what extent were you aware that the Bible tells the united account of God's plan for redemption? That it's, it's not just, some people have this idea, well, you know, Jesus coming and dying on the cross and going to the nations, that's just New Testament. I've, I have people who I've talked to who have told me, well, Christians, really, we don't need the Old Testament. There's nothing there for us, which you can't, yeah, I, you can't understand the New Testament without the Old Testament, but, but that's one thing, but to understand that all along, we see this thing. Have you guys seen that idea before where your redemption and God's plan, his rescue plan, it wasn't, it was before the beginning of time, all that stuff was laid out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's, sometimes we forget that, I think. You know, I, so I personally, I love the Old Testament. Um, I remember when I was in college, um, I'd done Hebrew, and and I was in a, in a reading group with some people, and I, I just, one of the seminary professors at um, the uh, Assembly of God Seminary, that's where the reading group was, and, and I just asked Bill, I'm like, Bill, um, I sometimes feel bad, because I just really, really love the Old Testament. He's like, that's okay, you know, it's like two-thirds of the Bible, so just just so you don't love it, you know, six more than 66%, you're good. But But even in that understanding of, no, but we have to know that, to know the gospel. And, and again, the Bible is one story that leads to Jesus, that leads to this rescue plan, that shows God's purpose from the beginning of time. And so um, that's, that's important to remember. Like a what? Like a, like a Christian life is like a stock market. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And well, and part of it is, yeah, we have to be consistent, you know. And and I'll be. I like the stock market thing because you've got those companies that they're volatile. They go up real quick, but guess what? Those companies, 
Like, um, you know, and some of those companies are called meme stocks, like um, GameStop is one of them. The last couple of years, they went up really high, really quick. Now they're taking a nosedive, you know. But then you have the companies that they may not go up real quickly, but they're steady. And there are companies that, that they just kind of continue along the way. And I think that's healthy. It's okay to have like mountaintop experiences, you know, like, like this summer, we get to send the youth to IYC in Orlando. That's going to be wonderful. But the idea is that can't be all there is because if there's just a mountaintop and a fall, that's not a good thing. What has to happen in between is that, that the building up of the steadiness. And so that's important. And so, um, but yeah, I, th- I like that metaphor. So had you guys noticed the ways in which God makes it very clear that he has a heart for the nations in, in the Old Testament before? So, okay, is that, that's not new? Okay, so I just, I, I grew up in a church that didn't view it that way. You know, that kind of viewed a separation between New Testament and Old Testament. Old Testament was for the Jews and New Testament was for the Christians. And yes, there's some good things in here, but really God wasn't concerned about the nations until after Jesus. You know, so, but, you know, I always thought that was weird because like when you look at even Jesus' genealogy, you have two of the women who are mentioned in his genealogy they're not Jews. You have Ruth, who is a Moabite, and then you also have Rahab, who is a, from Jericho, a Canaanite. Um, and we see even in that. Okay, um, let's talk about zeal for missions. Do you think, do you agree that that should be a Christian attribute? Should we be concerned about these things? Yeah? So, how do we live that out? Okay. Well. Mm-hmm. Yep, you can go on a mission trip. Financially support them. Pray for them. Pray. I mean, that's, that's one of the things you know, we've got. Uh, I told you guys about the Operation World app. You know, you could be praying for the nations. And like, uh, let's see. What nation today? It's China. That's the nation that is on the calendar today to pray for. You know, when you, what you put your attention towards says a whole lot about you. And really, your, um, I can't remember the exact quote, but essentially, your entire life can be summed up in what you paid attention to in life. You know, what was important to you, that's the stuff you pay attention to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's Jesus says where your treasure is, there your heart is too. You know, that, that's, that's what matters. And so I think one of the ways we can be zealous is by paying attention and, and listening and, and focusing and doing things like praying for the nation, doing things like really thinking, okay, what does God want in my neighborhood? What does God want in, in my town, in my state? And how can I be about that? And then how can I be about that in other places as well? So, and again, that, that zealous, that's that boldness in, in um, Acts. But as we focus on what God wants and as we listen, we are easier and easierly going to be, if that's a word, be able to live that out in our life. So, okay. And here's a question. In which ways have you embraced your call to exalt God personally in your life? You know, because we have to answer those questions. We have to think about that and say, okay, if, if I am created to enjoy God and exalt God, how am I doing at that? You know? And how can I do better? And where can I serve in that area? Those are questions that we have to ask. And we have to ask as individuals. And we have to ask, okay, as a church, how are we doing with that? What are the ways that we are trying to do that? What are ways that we inconvenience our personal lives to make that happen? I'll be honest. 
I, I love people. There's some time when I'm talking to some people, like, I would love to not have to have a conversation right now, right? Have you guys ever been there? But I also realized, okay, but, well, well, I, I don't even like that because I, I think we use that as an excuse sometimes. But, but no, we are called love every year. So I, have, I check myself on a regular basis, and sometimes I'm in conversations when I'm out in public with people that it's amazing how people who barely know you will just tell you everything. <laughs> yeah, imagine you do have that every day, Beth Ann. But, and it could be easy to kind of like, oh, you know. But one of the things I realize is, man, this is one of the ways that I can show God's love. And I, I might be able to plant some seeds that I wouldn't have if I hadn't listened to their story. People want to tell you their stories. I think Sherry and I have told you when we were uh, restarting our church in Anderson and trying to do a plant there, we, one of the things that we did is we really, you know, like really got to know a lot of the people at any of the restaurants in town. Whenever we went out to eat, we made that as part of our, our practice that we asked them, well, you know, about themselves, about their family. And it would be ama- amazing. We only had to ask one or two questions, and they tell you whole, their whole life story, and they would share what they're struggling with. And then we could pray with them, and we could connect with them. And that had an impact. That had a huge impact. And, and I remember, like, at one point, one of the, the um, managers at one of the restaurants that I knew, because we had been there, and, and we had been in the same circles and stuff like that, but she's like, man, Jared, if you ever want a job, Please let me know. I will hire you in a second. Because she saw that I cared about people and that she saw what, wh- who I was. And because of that, she saw that as something important that she, she could definitely use to have around that restaurant. You know, Those are things that matter. What we focus on, what we put our attention on, is going to have an impact on everything else. And it's not always about us. So, I mean, it just, it isn't. So, so what, what are, as you think about your life, David asked the question, what would it look like to me to align your life with God's big picture? And how would that change things? That idea of, of dedicating ourselves, our attention to enjoying and exalting God to the nations. That's something that we have to ask. Okay? So I want you guys to, to think about that. Pray about that. Okay, Galatians 3, 6-9. through nine. So Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. What's the result of Abraham's faith? It was credited to him as righteous. It didn't mean, let's be honest, when you look at Abraham's life, he had issues. We've talked about some of those on Sunday morning, but there are a lot of issues that we could spend a lot more time talking about. But He was doing his best, and he had faith. And so God credited that to him as righteousness. And because of that, it's through him that the nations are blessed. And we are part of that family spiritually, as I said. We are children of Abraham by faith. And we've talked about the ways that God's story of of redemption begins before Jesus and Abraham, that God is going to be going to bless everyone through him. We we talked about even tonight about how we see that throughout the rest of the Bible as well. So what were you taught about what was necessary for God to accept or save you? Did you, did, was anyone taught that you had to do everything right before you could come to God? There, there, there are churches that they may not verbally teach that, but that's still the understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and really, some of the this, this, and this, it's like, okay, I can see that, but we don't see that in Scripture. Like, 
I know Church of God, you don't go watch movies was the old school thing, right? You don't go to dances. You know, you... <laughs> okay. But, but, you know, but I think part of it is, yeah, we, we have, they, we, the church, and, and a lot of churches do this, did the same thing the Pharisees did. They made all these rules around the, the, the principles and, and made the hedges to protect, that's what the Pharisees were doing, to protect the law. And really, God's message is that you believe. Now, believe means you repent means you turn from those things, but, but you believe that Jesus came and died for you and you receive him as Lord and Savior. Belief in the ancient world, it wasn't separated from everything you do, but it didn't mean if you messed up, all of a sudden all that was done. It meant you got up and you walked again. You followed Jesus. You, you kept trying again. And so, yep. And so um, that... Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point, Ashley, that the idea that being a Christian is not a, okay, everything is, is, is all taken care of, you know, no, we still struggle. We still you know, are going to walk through things and, and it is a growth process. Yeah, and 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 that's and that's why, uh, huh? Yeah, that's why when I talk about sanctification, I make sure everyone knows. Well, when we see that in the Bible, when we see that word, um, it is always a a what I would call a progressive verb. It, it's not punctiliar, which is a big fancy word. It means it happens at one point and it's done. Sanctification always is a process that is ongoing. And so, um, but yeah, I think the idea that, well, everything is all fixed and that's it. And some people, you know, and I've gotten in arguments with people over that. I'm like, but when you look at Scripture, they talk about Christians struggling. Well, they didn't have faith. These are guys who wrote the New Testament that were talking about this, right? Okay, Paul didn't have faith. Paul was very honest. He struggled. But he continued to get up and follow Jesus. And, and God said, my grace is sufficient, and just told him to hold on to that. It's not easy, but in my humble opinion, most things that are easy to do aren't worth doing. It's the things that are difficult, the things that we have to work at, that those are the things that are worthwhile. And we don't have to do it on our own either. We have the Holy Spirit, and that's part of why we're supposed to have the church, for us as a people to come together, to be about making sure we are, are exalting God and enjoying God in our lives and among the nations, and do it together in love. That matters. Huh? It is. You do have to, you are right, it's like a, it's, it's well, you, you use it or you lose it type thing. I mean, that's muscle. Yeah. No. And, and you have to listen. You have to be engaged. I think that's a great point. You have to be engaged. It's not, it's not even enough just to be a Christian and, well, once a week or once a couple times a month, I go to church and that's it. That's not enough, you know, because we need spiritual nourishment. If I just ate once a week, I'd be a lot thinner than I am now, right? I would, I would die very quickly, I'm pretty sure. But, but the idea that we have to be active, we have to, to, to work out spiritually, be engaging in things, and, and really being in step with the Spirit, that's a, it's hard to do at first. But as you listen, and as you spend time, yeah. Yeah, praying and reading the Bible, those are always among the list of things that are foundational to spiritual disciplines. Um, and as we do them, we'll get better at other things. And as we do them and we love people, I'm sorry, but God's going to give us more opportunity to love people, which will make us stronger. You know, it, it's, it's not done. Sanctification never ends. It's a glorious thing. It's also a struggle. 
at times because it never ends. There's always an area where God is working. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's part of why it's our job to to talk to people that, about those things, to let them know about those things, and and be honest about it. You know, I, you know, the the church I grew up in, you weren't honest about your struggles. You weren't honest about man. Sometimes I just don't want to be around people, right? Sometimes I've just had a bad day, and I know if I'm around people, I may say something I shouldn't say. I may treat someone in a way that I shouldn't treat them. Um, we, when we're not honest about them, then people think that, well, they should be perfect. And when they aren't, then it's like, aha! What I've found is when I have actual conversations with people, even if they're not a believer, I'm honest about things. And there is a respect there. Because I'm, I'm, I'm trusting them enough, I guess, to this is who I am. No! No, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and that's part of what it mean, means to, to really exalt God is how we live that way. That matters. And, and even if there are other Christians that aren't that way, we are differentiated and they can see, well, at least they get it. You know, I, my, my brother, he is, he is struggling. He's an agnostic now. But and part of it is because he had church hurt. And but as I talk to him, you know, he'll bring up things. I'm like, yeah, but not everyone's like that. And he's like, I know, Jared, I know you're not like that. I know your people aren't like that. But but this is what I see. I'm like, yes, but that isn't the whole picture, you know. And as I'm able to have those conversations with him, I'm able to to let be honest about. Yeah, sometimes it, the struggle is real. You see, yeah, sometimes I don't get it right. Um, but that honesty allows me to speak into his life because I'm not acting like something I'm not, and I'm not being real. We have to do that if we're going to exalt God among the nations. Well, yeah, it's not our job to deal with them. Our job is to deal with me, and then our job is, like, that's the other thing, is we need to be, like a lot of churches, their goal is to grab other Christians from other churches. We need there are a lot there are a lot of people that don't know Jesus. We need to be worried about that. No, we, we need to help people come to know Jesus, come to experience his life, help each other live that out, and and move forward and exalt God in in Robertsdale, in the Broadtop, in WP, in Western PA, in the nations. But it starts with us here. It starts with us having a passion and having a zeal, and that means we put our attention on it. That's where it starts. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for today. We pray that you'd be with us, and I just pray that you would... Um, Help us to put our attention on the things that you care about. Help us to, to focus on those things so that we can enjoy and exalt you among the nations, God, so that we can live out a life that, that has integrity as we follow you so that we, when we struggle, we can be honest about it and we can share what you have done in our lives with those around us. I just pray that you would put people in our way to do that with, to, to share what you are doing, God, and, and let us know the ways that we can minister to them, God, even if it's just listening, even if it's just um, offering advice, God. We just pray that you would put people in our way that we can share your good news with. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.